You're listening to Decoding Healthcare Innovation with Carrie Nixon and Rebecca Gwilt, a podcast for novel and disruptive business leaders seeking to transform how we receive and experience healthcare. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Nixon, and welcome to another episode of Decoding Healthcare Innovation. I am really pleased to be joined today by Sal Detrain. He is the Managing director, director of Impactful Capital, which is a venture capital firm that focuses exclusively in the healthcare space. And that really has a really pretty interesting operating my, model that I wanted to share with um, you, the listeners. Sal, welcome to the show. I'd love for you first to say a word or two um, and, and give everyone a, a bit about your background and, and how you got to the VC space. Sure. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sal Detrain, Managing Partner at Impactful Capital. Um, I've gotten to the VC space about 20 years ago um, after a background in investment banking and then moved into the VC space around the 2020 timeframe or 20, 2000 timeframe. Sorry about that. And um, really, our whole model was going back at that point in time. We had had some exposure to an angel organization in working with operators and leading entrepreneurs. And that really helped us shape how we structured a predecessor firm called Nucleus Partners based in Palo Alto. Um, and then I went on to actually get some real world experience in being an operator for 12 years in one of my portfolio companies. So it was a company called Media Analytics that is still in existence. Um, we helped build that from one to over 120 million in revenues and exited to Toma Bravo on our way to going public in 2015. Um, which led me to forming Impactful Capital. And I really wanted to get back to working with early stage and growth stage entrepreneurs focused on the digital health space. And so Sal, when you first got involved um, as an investment banker, were you focused exclusively in healthcare um, for your investments or, or did it just so happen that some of your portfolio companies were in the healthcare space? So it was actually, uh, the focus was on technology companies more broadly. Um, I, I live out here in California in the Bay Area. Uh, so it was really a focus on traditional technologies that uh, were sort of common to Silicon Valley. Um, and so then uh, over time, as I got more into the investing side was when I actually got more exposure to devices and things that more sort of brought me closer to healthcare. And then uh, when I uh, discovered the company Medi Analytics um, at the time, Medi Finance, uh, that really was more my first sort of venture into the pure digital health space. How would you say that your experience as an operator at Medi Analytics has shaped your philosophy as an investor today? Yeah, uh, very much so. Uh, so the the aspects of having a higher EQ of how hard it is to build a company was one of the key aspects of my learning from that experience. And then, you know, really just having, um, you know, a, a, a stronger sense for the type of execution that you have to be able to perform uh, on relative to the strategy. So that whole strategy to execution phase became, you know, uh, obviously something that I prided myself in my operating career and we hope to bring to a lot of our portfolio companies. And, um, you know, as, as a recovering operator, if you will, um, and more on the investor side, really a recognition now that, you know, my job is not to run companies, my job is to help support those companies and, you know, one way not be a crutch, you know, in, in terms of, you know, tr trying to offset some, some weaknesses in a team. And on the other aspect, really be able to provide a broader ecosystem of, you know, support and relationships that can help catalyze the business. Yeah, that, uh, that, that is totally understandable. I think it is, um, it is very, very important to understand what a startup organization is going through if you're going to be an investor in a startup organization. Um, uh, so I know you, you can appreciate that. So Sal, you and I met um, a few years ago. Uh, you were, I think, ex exploring an investment in a particular company. And uh, I, think, I think I had come in uh, to give some, some feedback on sort of the direction that uh, I saw that particular industry in the, in the healthcare space heading. Um, we got to know each other a little bit through that, through that project. And uh, in full disclosure, I ended on coming, in as, coming on as a, 
ended up coming on as a special advisor to Impactful Capital, just in a role where, you know, every, every so often I, I am able to sort of weigh in um, and, and lend some of my expertise um, to some of the investment decisions. So, so, you know, I have found your approach in Impactful Capital, which is a very, very hands-on approach, to make a ton of sense. And I would love for you to tell our listeners a little bit more about that sort of hands-on model and why you believe it's the best way to invest. Yeah, so I think it goes back to the operating experience and really having great investors. We had Bain Capital Ventures as our primary equity sponsor at Medi. Um, you know, the, the patience that you need to have in building an early stage to growth stage company. Um, but also really, we started with the team and sort of it harkens back to what I was describing earlier relative to uh, Nucleus Partners and then the way we've built Impactful, which was to really find a dynamic group of individuals who have been highly successful in, in the chosen area of our focus. And then for us, that happens to be healthcare executives and digital health entrepreneurs. So we've built and established a national network of these individuals. Many of them come from my relationships that I built at Medi Analytics. So these are 15, 20 year relationships and working together with other companies, uh, CEOs and senior executives. Um, and then uh, as they sort of progress in their careers, kind of coming back together and impactful, which is pretty cool. You know, one great example of that is a partnership I've had with uh, at Medi with the advisory board company and one of one of their leading executives who was my counterpoint is now one of our venture partners. And that was a highly successful channel distribution relationship and Hamilton and I have had, you know, a relationship for over 15 years, really focused on these areas. But we have, you know, built a partnership of now 10 partners uh, with a national footprint and coverage model. And that also allows us to have bandwidth in a very unique way, not only in sourcing and vetting deals, uh, but in the other area where you need to have substantial bandwidth, which is on the other piece of value creation and portfolio management. And so those two areas are where I think it's really critical to have that expansive bandwidth. And then we, uh, through that team, we have an ecosystem of relationships that really allow us to get, get in touch with or be able to put opportunities in front of pretty much anyone in healthcare in the healthcare services environment, whether it be a payer, a provider, an ACO organization, as well as other investors and, and executives that we want to recruit to our companies. And so that ecosystem is really critical to our model. And the last piece is really a very disciplined approach that wouldn't be able to be executed on if we didn't have this team I just described of partners and advisors. We also have a network, which you're one of our advisors you just referenced, of 25 senior executives across the U.S. as well who bring different perspectives and are making a uh, uh, obviously a contribution to our firm. And so in our process, we spent about four to six months, which is really unique. Um, instead of just doing traditional due diligence, we actually are performing more of an operational due diligence where we get to know the entrepreneur and they get to know us in a more material way. And we think that's uh, really a two-way street and, and very, very mutually beneficial because then they get an opportunity to understand whether we're the right investor and we get a chance to really assess whether it's the right investment and we'll unpack more of that. And we take a very milestone-based approach to investing at a seed series A or series B stage, which again, I'm happy to unpack. And then really being able to leverage a set of downstream investor relationships that help us support our companies in their series B or series C rounds when we've sort of, uh, you know, basically made our series of investments and then it's a chance to pass the baton to them as well. Yeah, so finding the fit right between the company and the the investor is really really important. Um, it can be a very close relationship, and it can be a very synergistic relationship. Um, and uh, I think you've done you know a fantastic job at cultivating some of those relationships with your portfolio companies and identifying companies that that you know that are really a good fit. So um, so tell me a little bit about what it looks like for you to take a look at a particular company like like what do you look for specifically in companies that are are pitching to you and how do you think about deciding whether or not it makes sense to invest 
Yeah, so great question, Kerry. Um, as we look at um, uh, our deal flow on a particular year, I'm just going to give some metrics and then sort of the things we look for. So we'll look at close to 300 or more deals in any particular year, and then we'll spend a considerable amount of time with about 30 or 40 where we're doing multiple meetings. So that down selection seven to one is really based on the, the vetting and the sourcing uh, mechanism we just described with the partners and the advisors. And then we'll take that down to 10 to 15 companies that will actually develop over this four to six month period that I described earlier in a process where we're getting to know each other and making sure it's the right fit and ensuring there's alignment around the plan, the team, and the strategy moving forward. And then out of that group, we actually only make three to five investments per year. So for a variety of different reasons, the, those that we're developing, there may just not be a fit that they discover as we're going through that process or we discover relative to uh, the investment strategy and some of the things we're going to like. So the things we like and the things we're really looking at is, you know, one is how thoughtful were they and what are the sort of ecosystem relationships that they've deployed to build their team? And, and it's not to say that they have to have a complete team, but we want to understand how they built the team and how that team is built to last. And so that, you know, it all starts with the team. And then there are other aspects that really are around their knowledge of the market. How do they think about the industry and how does that align with our thoughts on the market as well? And um, one of the big aspects to our model, because we are hands-on, is their openness to hands-on support and, and input into the business. And if for whatever reason that is not a good fit, that, that would be another, another reason. And then uh, equally so back to us, uh, you know, what we, we have to perform is to hold up our end of the partnership with the entrepreneur. It has to be a business we can actually add value and impact. And there may be a, something we discover in the process where we're not able to impact that business as much as we, we originally envisioned to be the case. And the last is really around practical application of advanced technology. We're focused on value-based care tech enablement and behavioral health tech enablement. Um, and it really comes back to, uh, does the, has this group of entrepreneurs found a practical application of artificial intelligence or telehealth or virtual care, or remote patient monitoring or natural language processing or whatever it might be, blockchain. But, but is it a practical application with a tangible art? Yeah, so, so for me, um, when you were first telling me about, about Impactful, that question that you ask, which is, can we add value to this company by, by playing a role, uh, not only as an investor, but, but as uh, you know, a mentor and as a connector, um, that type of thing was, was really what, what struck me um, as, as a, a pretty important differentiator. Um, okay, so you mentioned now that that you're focused on value-based care and behavioral health. So you are specialized not just in healthcare, not just in health tech, but you have really drilled down to two particular areas. Let's let's talk about that a little bit and why why you have decided on those areas. Yeah, so going back to the experience of Medi Analytics, we were really focused on how people paid their their downstream ecosystem of healthcare providers and how how those providers got paid, right? And so we had a suite of analytics on that equation. So as the models continue to shift and only continue to shift in the coming years, there's still an infrastructure to be built and to be, you know, sort of further iterated on relative to value-based care enablement. And that includes everywhere from how do you contract to how do you set up provider networks? How do you execute on those provider networks? How do you transform care and benefits? And then the last piece, how do you transform outcomes? And then similarly on the behavioral health side, I, I had a colleague that worked with me at Medi Analytics, our chief medical officer, Dr. Terry Fouts, who, who has said to me in the past that Sal, if you don't fix the behavioral health condition, you don't have a chance on the chronic care disease. So very early on, we made an investment going back to late 2016 in a business uh, called the Novotel Telepsychiatry, which actually back in December was recently acquired by Quartet Health. Um, and at, back at the time, no one was investing in behavioral health. And yeah, it was those a, were the pre days, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the market was, it was a belief in the market that you couldn't make money in behavioral health as either an entrepreneur or as a service provider. Well, a lot has changed, right? COVID obviously only has exacerbated a lot of those, uh, those conditions or the crisis that exists in mental and behavioral health. 
So similarly, what we've focused on is actually not just those two areas, but the intersection of those two areas where value-based care it has so much interdependencies on behavioral health and likewise relative to behavioral health with value-based care. You almost can't have the other, one without the other. And so that's why we really feel that a specialty in these two areas and the way in which we built the partnership out of both partners and advisors who are experts in those areas gives us a leg up to find the very best companies in both of those areas, again, on a national basis here in the U.S. Absolutely. The synergy there is tremendous and um, extremely important for success in, uh, in value-based care in particular, um, as you mentioned. Um, are you, what types of, you know, are you seeing any interesting trends in either the behavioral health space um, or the value-based care space in general that, that you're really keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think we're seeing more and more adoption of value-based care models and whether you want to call them pay for performance models or the design of the networks that actually execute on these models and, and, and how, how a lot of advanced technologies are being practically applied. So I think there had been a lot of funding in 2018, 2019, 2020, and even last year in these segments. Um, but, but, but I think there's still a, lot, a long way to go. We still see there being continued evolution of 2.0, 3.0 models within the value-based care side. And the same really applies to behavioral health. What we're seeing is, you know, we had, we had done some early work around outcomes in behavioral health and how do you measure outcomes, measurement-based care, those sort of things. Um, and what's interesting now is that that has become table stakes or, you know, tell a psychiatry that, that, that is a table stake to any behavioral health uh, solution, which is what the big reason that Quartet bought in Novatel is they didn't have that capability where they had a lot of advanced technology on the demand side of behavioral health and how do we you know, do precision behavioral health. So there's just a lot of, I think, evolution that will continue to occur as we think about what are, you know, version 2.0, version 3.0 of each of these particular markets. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, investment of the kind that you do plays in my view of a tremendous role in facilitating innovation in healthcare. Um, what, ha, what do you see as you're listening to these pitches as barriers to really innovating in the space? Yeah, I think you, you really have to be a student of the specific area that you're solving that problem. Not to say you have to have 30 years experience in that area, but you can't bring a naivete to how hard it is to build businesses in healthcare. Because one thing I've learned and, and many people have sort of reiterated to me along the way is just whatever, however long you think it's going to take to build a healthcare IT company or digital health company, it's going to take that, you know, a year longer than that. And so you have to prepare for the fact that you're going to have to be nimble and iterate. And one of the things we are always looking for is, you know, is someone falling in love with a technology and it's sort of a technology in search of a problem versus it being, you know, I, I really want to solve this problem. Now I'm going to bring best of breed technologies to bear and we have the expertise to do so to solve that problem. So I think that that approach is something we prefer versus the 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 latter where it's just, um, or I should say the former, where it is more of like a technology in search of a problem. And, and you know, the other issue is I think it's also very easy to get caught up in, you know, the validation you think of you're doing pilots in this industry and, and you just gotta be careful that those pilots become paying customers and long-term customers and that transition is so critical in a company that we have worked on together at Veda, Theta Data and the DC area um, is a great example of that and, 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 and how they were able to make that transition um, uh, over the course of the last couple of years. And, you know, I think the other aspect in the last one I'll say is just it, one, one of the, it's hard to build a company in this space, as I said earlier, um, but you got to surround yourself with just the best and the brightest people to help support you in that. And, you know, at this stage of my career, what makes me most excited is not being successful on my own and building my own company. It's seeing that success through the entrepreneur's eyes. And so th that's the approach I take with the entrepreneurs. And, and, you know, but it has to be one of which that's going to be well received in the sense of, again, wanting to have input and wanting to have, you know, the sheer, you're kind of co-raising a child together, if you will, you know, and, and that level of partnership. 
And, and I think, you know, there, there has to be a, a, a common respect for the partnership on both sides, you know, not from the investor having too much say into the business and the vice versa. The entrepreneur also has to be willing to, to accept that partnership with the investor. And so that's, that's obviously something we're always looking for. And if we don't see that, that would be one of the reasons we wouldn't move forward. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, okay. I think you mentioned that you see about 300 pitches a year. Is that right? Yep. Okay, that's a lot of pitches. I, I, I think we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this podcast. What do you see in pitches that you, number one, wish founders would do more of, or number two, wish they would not do at all? Yeah, I think there's there's a fine line between being very passionate about an area versus sort of, you know, trying to have always have a personal story. You know, I think... You know, I think that that was common years ago, but I think now I think people really want to really understand why you're passionate about this, why you're going to do everything it takes to make this business successful. And, and at the same time, you're 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 going to be open to sort of lots of thoughts around how you could develop this further. So so part of it is, is I think just be careful with the, the personal story aspect of it, because it is meaningful. But I don't think you have to sort of hang your whole hat on that. I mean, people are most concerned. Do you have a very compelling value proposition? And is it differentiated? And is it sustainable? And if you have those things, you know, your passion will come through. I think it's it's more of like you don't have to. It's more what you do than what you say kind of thing. And so I think that, that that's important in these pitches as well. And then I think the other one that I would think is, is worth mentioning here is you know, really being able to think about the competitive landscape and really understanding that it, a lot of these spaces are crowded. So you're really going to have to have a clear view on differentiation. And and I think that that also stems from, you know, I, I've seen uh, some recent articles in the last couple of years around instead of presenting sort of the Gartner Magic Quadrant um, or saying you don't have any competitors, which would be the worst thing to say because you do. Right. You have some and it could be in, in, internal internal IT at that. But but instead of like doing a, a, a Gartner Magic Quadrant to actually have a view that says, here's the status quo. And, and here are the things that this, the challenges with the status quo, and then here's our solution and here's how it's differentiated from the status quo. And I think that's a very clear way and a very concise way of showing your value proposition and differentiation in one slide. And if you can do that well, that, that I think crystallizes the value proposition for folks. That is great advice. In one slide, cut to the chase. What's the value proposition? We know how are you different than the status quo? I, I agree totally. The story is important in that it in that it does show where it's coming from, but but it's got to be a little bit more than that. So so Sal, are you what you have been very successful um, in your your first fund, the first uh, the first fund that you closed and and the investments that you made? Um, I believe you are in the midst of raising another fund. Is that right? That's correct. Excellent. Okay, we just began that process. Yeah, yeah. So that's got to be very exciting. So you're at the beginning of that process. And um, any any sort of um, thoughts or predictions for for down the road as you uh, as you sort of um, you know are we going to continue to see the amount of investment in healthcare and digital health that we have seen at record levels over the past year or so? I believe so. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything that's changed in the last couple of years. In fact, with COVID, it's it, I think it's only pointed out, you know, the problems with, you know, the adoption of value based care and that it is a better model over time, you know, that has more predictability to it and the like that behavioral health has only been more exacerbated by a lot of the trends and that there is a real problem in this country around health equity as well. Right. And, and all of those things need to be solved for. Um, and, and if you think about it, it's not just these, these multiple areas of opportunity, every single population, whether it be Native American or it also be uh, uh, women's health or, or different populations of Medicaid and the like, you, you really want to be able to provide solutions into these marketplaces that are really burgeoning. There's only more money being downstream from Medicaid, you, this is your area more than mine, but downstream from Medicare to Medicaid and the like, and 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 more managed care options being put out there. So I, I believe there will continue to be a proliferation of opportunities and, and new 
novel ways of solving these problems. I think one of the challenges that has occurred in venture capital is that there has almost been an overfunding of certain companies and an underfunding of others, right? So you look at just the statistics from last year, uh, of the 330 billion invested in venture capital in the US in 2021, almost 60%, 58% of those dollars went into mega deals. And a mega deal now is defined as a hundred million dollar round for a series A company. So or, for a series or, A you know, company. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So wow. so wow. when you think about it in that context, that those are, you know, that's what a lot of young companies are up against. However, I still think we're going to see a return back to people building companies in their right uh, phases and stages of development, where you fund the company properly for the Series A to get to a certain level of milestones and so on to the Series B, as opposed to sort of getting ahead of themselves. Because when you do, the pressure goes way up and you may be trying to do some unnatural acts to sort of perform against those uh, those metrics. And, and I think that's where we see some of the problems or lack of governance that presents itself when the Theranos of the world and others are out there where people have such pressure to perform that it unfortunately sometimes it goes down the wrong the wrong path. And so I think I think we're going to start to see a more of a return, particularly um, there's a huge opportunity for early stage funds like ours because many funds have moved up market to really help entrepreneurs take it from a seed stage to a series A stage. And what are those specific milestones and what is the amount of gas you need in a tank to achieve that with a little bit of buffer too, because it will take a little longer than you all expected. Um, but, but not try to, you know, because we have a big fund, we need to put more money into you and, and, you know, and, and that sort of that, that whole aspect. So I think we may see a return more back to basics, particularly with a lot of the uncertainty that's going on in the markets currently. Yeah, those mega deals can create a bubble too, right? And and you know, I've seen some some investments in some companies that have been a little bit of a head scratcher to me, and I see other companies out there that I think are absolutely fantastic that are having a really tough time. So, I'm with you. It makes sense to spread the wealth, spread the spread the risk, um, you know, uh, uh, take full advantage of of the talent that's out there by, you know, making sure we're funding as much of the talent as we can in the right way. So I think that's a great end note for us, Sal. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to record this webinar. Uh, I, will, I will say to our listeners that I had a little bit of a technical mishap earlier today and Sal was gracious enough to reschedule with me for um, for this evening. So I really appreciate it. It's great to catch up with you as always. And listeners, keep you know, stay in tune for the next episode of Decoding Healthcare Innovation. We'll see you next time. <laughs>